We're going to stay standing. For those of you who are new, everyone was standing. So you figured out quickly we're going to continue to stand as we read God's word, as we honor and, and really um, acknowledge God's word for what it is. We don't believe these are words merely of men, but of God. All scripture is God breathed and profitable. We find ourselves in Romans chapter 9 today, beginning in verse 14, going to read down to verse 24. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. Romans 9, 14 to 24. What then shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Well, what does molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Is the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. You may be seated. Well, hello, church. Good to be with you this morning. And to those of you who are joining us on live stream, it's a great privilege to be able to open God's word together. And so if you guys have a Bible, why don't you grab it? Um, we're going to be, well, we're going to be, we're going to be all the places today because you have asked me in this series to come up with one message to describe the most massive questions in the Christian faith. Thank you for that. I'm going to get a lot more sleep once this is through. Uh, each of these could be a series in and of itself, right? I mean, each of these could. If you haven't sensed that, you're like, man, these messages are dense. And I'm like, yes, that's because I'm bad at like trimming it down because I think all of this is so important. And so uh, we're going to continue. Just have your Bibles ready. We're going to be all over the place. Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, just name it. Lots and lots of places. Um, my name's Scott, by the way. I'm the lead pastor here at Doxa Church. And if you're new with us, just want to say welcome. I am so glad that you're here. I hang out um, on now for the summer, the hot windows in the lobby. That's me sweating it out over there. So if you want to come say hi, and uh, I would love the opportunity just to get to meet you and uh, hear your story a little bit would be my pleasure and hopefully get you some an uh, questions answered and get you plugged into Doxa Church in one way or another. Would love to get you dialed in there. And let me just say, church, I know we took last month in, into our homes. We didn't take it off with prayer night, but second Sunday tonight, come on, y'all. Okay, come on. Let's get there at five, amen? Let's get after the Lord. This is what makes church different. We don't rely on man-centered means to get things done. We rely on the Lord, and he's called us to pray. So let's pray, okay? And if you don't know how to pray, it's perfect. Just come and listen to other saints pray, and you'll learn how to pray. Okay, five o'clock tonight. Just want to push that again. Super, super important to see you there. It's the heartbeat of our church. Now, this is message, and I said this wrong last time. This is message numero ocho. Numero 
Ocho, number eight of our series, Now Concerning, and that's the phrase that Paul used in the second half of 1 Corinthians when he was answering a series of questions that the Corinthian church had for Paul. And so we've been answering the nine most pressing questions on your hearts and uh, have arranged those to take one of them down uh, once a week. We're on message number eight. This was your topic. Uh, Today is Now Concerning Evil and God's Goodness. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you, Ted Hayes in the house. Now, a couple weeks ago, I actually had the privilege of going to New York City. And uh, I haven't been there since like 2003. And so I think at the time that I was there, uh, the World Trade Center had just like a fence around it, right? And then they were going to build this monument. And and so I was really excited to, to go take a trip down there and so I saw what they had done, and how many have been there since and seen the, the museum and, and some of that stuff? Okay, so what they did was they basically, I mean, the, the place where the World Trade Center towers were, they've literally created these inverted fountains. You, you know that? It's pretty incredible, and around the fountain, there is this um, engraving of all of the names of all of the people who died in 9-11. And I mean, you could walk, it was, it was overwhelming to be a part of. Uh, And I think in our lifetime, it was one of the most demonstrably evil things that any of us could probably point back to and say, I went through that. I think of myself and how I took in evil at the time. To me, as a 14-year-old, or whatever I was at the time, it was, maybe I was 12, maybe I was 8, I don't know. I was young, okay? You want to laugh about that real quick? Yeah, (laughs) definitely, definitely young. That to me was overwhelming and coming to this place and it was so interesting because in the midst of preparing, I'm I'm preparing two, three, four weeks out for these messages because it's a whole ton of stuff I have to get through. I was reading a book at the time while I was there called Suffering and the Sovereignty of God by John Piper and he opens one of the chapters talking about not only was uh, 9-11 an atrocious event for just humans to take in in general, but it exposed the church for the kind of counsel and the depth of understanding of who God is that did not suffice to sort of come around the Christians after 9-11 and deal with the depths of suffering and hurt and evil that were being expressed. And so John Piper in his book, Suffering and the Sovereignty of God, connecting the events of 9-11, exposing kind of where the church fell afterwards, he says this, he says, quote, our vision of God in relation to evil and suffering regarding 9-11 was shown to be frivolous. It means weightless. It means light. The church has not been spending its energy to go deep with the unfathomable God of the Bible. Against the overwhelming weight and seriousness of the Bible, much of the church is choosing at this very moment to become more light and shallow and entertainment oriented and therefore successful in its irrelevance to massive suffering and evil. The popular God of fun church is simply too small and affable to hold a hurricane in his hand. The biblical categories of God's sovereignty lie like landmines in the pages of the Bible waiting for someone to seriously open the book. They don't kill but they do explode trivial notions of the Almighty, end quote. That is a sobering indictment of the church. We have to do better, and by God's grace, I pray that we will. So let's start in trying to answer this question today. The question that came in over and over and over again um, was, and I'm going to summarize it because I'm going to give you the basic framework for the question, which basically encompasses everyone's question. The question was, can you address the problem of evil, Pastor Scott? This is uh, the Achilles heel, it said, of Christianity, right? You were in your dorm rooms in college. You had that person that knew you were a Christian. They knew this was the way to get in there and stump you on the problem of evil. 
It's called the Achilles heel of Christianity because it's considered by many to be our great vulnerability and the premise of the problem of evil goes all the way back to the Greek philosopher Epicurus in 370, 341 to 270 BC and here's how he broke it down, okay? Here's the problem of evil. A, the biblical God is loving and good. B, the biblical God is all-powerful. C, evil exists, which throws A or B into question, okay? The Scottish philosopher David Hume came along, and maybe this is how you have understood it, or maybe it was presented to you. He took that basic premise, and he said it like this. If God is good and wants to eliminate sin but can't, he's not omnipotent. And if God is omnipotent and can eliminate sin but doesn't, he is not good. But God cannot be both omnipotent and good. That's where the argument goes. And so Christianity, Christians for a a long, long time have been trying to address as biblically as they can, as faithfully as they can, this question about the problem of evil. And the defenses against this presumed problem is called a theodicy. So if you've never heard that word before, we're going to learn a word. We're going to put our thinking caps on. We're going to learn this awesome word, a theodicy, okay? And if you get into apologetics, you're going to see this word. A theodicy is made up of two Greek words, theos. Anyone? Yep. It's the New Testament, theology. It's the New Testament word for God in the Greek, theos, and dekaios, which is the New Testament Greek word for justice or righteousness. It's this idea of how can we defend God's justice or righteousness over and against evil. And there have been many defenses, many theodicies made over time. I'm going to give you a few, and then we're going to anchor down into the one that I think is the most biblically faithful, although I want to say up front, there is no theodicy that answers every single minute question that you could possibly have about evil, but I believe we can get to a theodicy that is faithful to the scriptures and honoring to the God of the scriptures as we seek to faithfully proclaim his gospel in our world. So let me give you a few that are common and then I'll get you to the one that I think is best, okay? So the, by far the most common one is the free will defense. It is the natural go-to of the human mind. And the free will defense is simply this. God was so committed to giving us free will. In fact, that was such a high priority of God that in order to truly give us free will, he had to be willing to risk that we might screw it all up by having it. And that's essentially the foundation. Now, the problem with the free will argument, there's actually many problems with the free will argument. It might work on the surface, but as you think about it, the free will argument demands that there's a fall before the fall because you can't have a fallen action without a fallen inclination to get to that action. If you say, well, you know, they did it for no reason in the garden. Adam and Eve, they sinned for no reason. You remove their moral agency. If you say, Satan made me do it. Well, that was Eve's theodicy. Satan made me do it. And then Adam's was one better. It was that woman that you gave me, right? That double. And so not, not a great theodicy there. That removes the moral responsibility when you start to put others in uh, that responsibility place when the Lord's going to hold us accountable. If we're not accountable, God's not ultimately good or just for judging us. By far the most popular. Second theodicy that's common is the natural law defense. And this is pretty straightforward. We live in a world created by God. God's designed the world and the universe to work in a certain way. When you walk in line with how God's designed the universe to work, there's good that comes from that. When you walk out of step with how God's designed the universe to work, you're going to have consequences. This is a defense that helps remove the blame of evil from God and put it primarily on us. We go against those natural laws. There's consequences. It isn't God's fault. That's us. 
Many of these defenses are ways to try to get God off the hook for evil. But I want to say something up front. I'm going to say it again later. God does not want to be let off the hook for evil. That's probably what's going to blow some people's minds today. I want to emphasize God does not want to be. Don't try to spend your time letting God off the hook. I'm going to show you he does not want to be let off the hook. But I get it. It means well. We're trying to defend who God is. I think I just rattled some minds right there. And you're like, prove it. And I will. Okay. Option three. This is a, I'm, I'm calling these seminars, by the way. They're like seminars meets a sermon for the record. And so just saddle up. I, I didn't even say like, get a pen, get a pad. I just, it's just business. Let's do this. Are we okay? Okay. Option three. This is called the best of all possible worlds defense. Now we're moving a little bit towards this kind of greater emphasis on the sovereignty of God over evil, okay? We're getting closer here. The best of all possible worlds defense is that an omnibenevolent God would create only a world that was the best possible world that could exist. Seems logical. Yet, Evil exists, so it must be necessary to bringing about the best possible world. That's, that's a defense. It's, it's got some points that I think are respectable. I don't think it's the best defense, but it's got something there that you can talk about. Here's where I want to camp out today. This is what I believe is the most faithful to Scripture. Like it says, doesn't answer every question about evil, but I think addresses it in its big picture context. Um, Scott Christensen called this in his book, What About Evil? The Greater Glory Theodicy. The Greater Glory glory theodicy. That's what I want to defend today. I want to defend that our name, Doxa Church, glory, is behind the right understanding of how evil works in God's world. Here's the idea behind the greater glory defense. The idea is the fall of humanity was no mistake. Okay, our fall into sin, no mistake. God purposed the fall to magnify his glory in a way that simply an unfallen world cannot do. Okay, and the framework kind of goes like this. And so we'll break this down. In fact, I'm gonna give you a few things right now. And if you're like, you know, frantically scribbling things down, don't worry about it. Number one, it's online. You can listen to it again. Um, number two, I'm going to boil it down to one sentence, big idea. So if you want to just listen now instead, I'm going to give you kind of the framework of this great glory of uh, theodicy, and then I'll get you to the big idea. Okay. So here's the idea behind this. The first thing that's built into God's gr uh, greater glory theodicy is that God's ultimate purpose and freely creating the world is to supremely magnify the riches of his glory. Okay, that's our defense. That's the defense behind our name, that everything God does ultimately is to magnify, to extend, to share the glory of his name. Now, the next part of this is that God's glory is supremely manifested in the atoning work of Jesus Christ for our redemption. He is the sole means of redemption for any and all who would turn from their sin and put their faith in Jesus Christ, the sin bearer. Therefore, redemption is unnecessary unless human beings have fallen into sin. Therefore, the fall of humanity is necessary to God's ultimate purpose in creating the world. Being reminded, of course, along the way that God's greatest glory is always tied to our greatest good. We're gonna spend our time talking about this, okay? Now, if that just went over your heads, here's your one sentence, ready? Big idea for this morning. Evil exists to magnify the glory of God through redemption in Jesus Christ. What I want to try to give you 
is the defense about the problem of evil that doesn't stray far from the gospel. So that when you're pressed in a dorm room, when you're pressed at work, when you're pressed at the gym on this question, you're never far from the gospel. Okay? I want you to get to the gospel. I want you to be able to defend this in light of the gospel. And I think that's the primary purpose. Evil exists to magnify the glory of God through redemption in Christ. Redemption being that good news, that gospel truth. And so the way we're going to break this down in our time as we unfold this greater glory theodicy is we're going to start with evil exists. We're going to build off this big idea. We'll start with the first two words. Evil exists. Then we're going to go to God wills evil to exist. It's the only reason it can be here. I'm going to make that case. And then we're going to say God wills evil to exist for a glorious purpose. We'll draw this thing to a close. Evil exists. God wills evil to exist. God wills evil to exist for a glorious purpose. All of that will be on the screen. want to let you know kind of where we're going ahead of time. So let's start with evil existing. Probably the most important question just to getting us started is, what is evil, right? In our world, it's like evil is this, you know the, the yin and the yang symbol? That's how we live, isn't it? So often in our culture, it's like there's, there's this force of good and there's this force of evil and they're 50-50. We don't really know who's gonna win, but in most movies, the good guy wins, but not always, it's a force, it's a power, it's this independent entity, and, and I'm just here to tell you that, that evil is not its own independent entity. It's not its own source, it's not yin and yang, it's not 50-50. Oh, we weren't sure if God was gonna pull that one out. No, no, he was gonna pull it out. No, rather, evil is in action. Not a force, not a substance, it's an action or it's an activity. And when you get, and this is interesting about church history, this is helpful to understand, when you get subjects in life that are mysterious, that are hard to comprehend, sometimes the best way to define it is by what it isn't. You'll see that if you go back and read the creeds and stuff, get back into the Council of Nicaea, get back into the Council of Chalcedon, you go back in time in church history and they'll take something really complex like the Trinity and tell you, they'll define what the Trinity is by telling you what's not true about the Trinity. Or in this case, we're gonna define what evil is by defining what it isn't. There are some Latin words that are used to describe this, but we're gonna give them to you in English. Three words to help us understand evil. Negation, privation, and actualization. Okay? Negation, we know what to negate something means, correct? We'll talk about it. Privation is the idea of a lack or a want of conformity with something, something that's lacking and then actualization. With something like evil, you don't just kind of, it's, it's hard to get our hands around it, so we need to define it biblically, and here's the first thing we find. We find that evil is defined by negation. Evil is defined by negation. It can only be defined against the backdrop of what is good. That's massively important. In the Bible, you understand what evil is because it isn't godliness. Rather, it's un, tell me, godliness. You find out what evil is by understanding what righteousness is. And it's evil expression is unrighteousness. That's how we learn about what evil is. The presence of evil points to the reality of good. Now, that's what your unbelieving friends need to understand. While they're pressing you to explain why there's evil, explain why there's evil, explain why there's evil, you need to be reminding your unbelieving friends, I have the responsibility to you to explain why evil exists, but you have the responsibility to me to explain why evil and good exists or that you even care about good. Because evil is irrelevant if good doesn't matter. How do you know? Says who? Says who? 
So you're an image bearer, that's how. You have the law of God written on your heart, and you're so rebellious, you're even denying that reality as you speak into something as if you were able to, who cares if evil is a thing unless good is a thing? Evil would just be life. It becomes an argument, evil does, not against God, but for his existence. Because if there's evil, there's good. If there's good, there's a moral standard bearer a lawgiver, someone who is good. Evil is understood by negation. Evil, uh, theologians say, is parasitic. It, it, it kind of comes off. That was a weird sound I just made. <laughs> what was funny about that is everyone looked up for a second. If I could like summon more of those over time to get your attention like that, it's like quasi Donald Duck going there. <laughs> you can't ask me to do it again though because I don't think I would ever be able to do that. I was like, Lord, we're going to need some moments to just break up the sermon today. I was told in seminary, too, don't be the hero of your own stories, you know? So that's great. Those are humbling moments as <laughs> Donald Duck is now your preacher today. <laughs> so that's the kind of fun we have at my expense. Okay, so back at it, guys, back at it. Every, you should have seen it, everyone's face. Is he going to talk about that? I'm going to have to now. I've never seen so many heads come up. <laughs> oh, boy. You, hey, live stream, you had to be here. You had to be here, okay? All the more reason to get back ASAP. Hear those sounds up front. I'm not sure how those come in on Surround Sound. All right. <sighs> okay, cool. Yeah, where was I, right? I actually know. That's the worst part. Okay, so uh, what is evil? We're talking about what is evil, and, and we're talking about evil as negation. Uh, it's, it's measured against what's good, and we're talking about evil as privation, which is this idea of uh, speaking to some lack or deficiency or decay of some good. It's a, it's a want of conformity, Right? The way I'm using want there, a want of conformity in the Westminster Confession, which is like the Presbyterian kind of standard for their confessional beliefs um, on the question of what is sin, and it's their kind of catechetical response, they define it in terms of lack. Sin is want of conformity to or transgression of the law of God. So when we talk about privation as it pertains to evil, we are saying that evil is some lack or deficiency or decay of some good feature. Now what the reformers did was they added this third word. It's not just a lack of conformity with something good. It's not just defined against the backdrop of what is good, but it is also actual or actualized. Reformers added this to keep from the notion that evil is not a thing. Some people think evil is a mere illusion. You get the Christian scientists, which I've always been told, Christian science is like grape nuts. If you've had the cereal, it's neither grapes nor nuts. Christian science isn't Christian or science. That's for sure true. And, uh, and with Christian science, there's this belief that evil is an illusion, and so the reformers are like, wait a minute, when we say evil is not its own independent thing, we're also not saying it's an illusion. Evil is a real thing. It's a real action. It's a real activity with real effects, and its impact is really devastating. And obviously, all the evil that comes has stemmed from the results of the fall. That sin was that entrance point, as far as we can see in Scripture, of evil coming into fruition, so there's some breakdowns of how evil works. It started with that moral evil of rebelling against God. And so we call moral evil things like sin or iniquity or transgression or wrongdoing. Okay, that would be moral sin. And because of moral sin and the result of the fall... 
Because of original sin and its effects, we have things like natural evil and supernatural evil. So not just moral evil of sin and transgressions and iniquity and wickedness, but we also have natural evil like illnesses, diseases, disasters, catastrophes, accidents, mental and physical handicaps, and all of that is built into a result of the curse. Evil's parasitic off and against the backdrop of what is good. Now, I want to move to the second reality, which is that God wills evil to exist. And that might be tough to hear. I want to break it down, and then I don't want to spend most of my words in this section. I want to let God's word speak for itself. God wills evil to exist. It is the only way that evil gets here is that God willed it to be here. God is sovereign over all. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purposes of the Lord that will stand. Ephesians 1.11 says, God works all things according to the counsel of his will. I mean all things. When it's all things, it means nothing is outside of this. I mean nothing. I mean not even a sparrow falling to the ground happens apart from the Father's will. Think about that for a second. Every sparrow. That's, that's Jesus, by the way, saying that in Matthew chapter 10. Not even a sparrow falls to the ground apart from the Father. All things working according to the counsel of his will, not even a sparrow falling to the ground, not even evil, evil in all of its forms is within the realm of all things working together according to his plan within Ephesians 1, 11. Evil's included. All things means all things. So then the question becomes, what is God's relationship to evil? Okay, okay. This is where we see in the Bible, very, very clearly, places like Deuteronomy 32, 4. God is a God of faithfulness and without iniquity. Just and upright is he. We see in places like James chapter 1 in verse 13. Say, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. What you need to hear from me as I say God wills evil to exist is that God never directly does evil. And yet, that is not to say he doesn't permit send, or even create evil. Now, if that doesn't do one of those emoticon brain explosions right there, that's, that's when it should. Let me, let me qualify this idea of what I said. Yet it doesn't say, it doesn't, it's not to say he doesn't permit, send, or create evil. I like what Jonathan Edwards says about this when he was asked about God being the author of sin. He rejects that terminology for God in that, in the sense of him being the actor of sin. He says, Edward says this, probably one of the greatest minds America's ever produced. Edward says, it's not that God is the actor of sin, but the permitter or not a hinderer of sin. And at the same time, a disposer of the state of events. In such a manner for wise, holy, and most excellent ends and purposes, that sin, if it be permitted or not hindered, will most certainly and infallibly follow, namely those wise, holy, and most excellent ends and purposes, end quote. Well, that's Edwards. 
What, what does scripture have to say about this? Well, I think scripture is clear about God's sovereignty over evil and never directly doing evil, but doesn't, it's not to say he doesn't permit it, send it, or even create it. Let me give you some examples in the book of Genesis, and we can just kind of walk through this. You can go to Genesis 37, and we'll just take a quick walk through the Old Testament. Genesis 37 we see the unfolding of the story of Joseph and God clearly allows, permits, or hinders not Joseph's brother's desire to bring evil upon Joseph. It was clear to everyone that Joseph was dad's favorite and he was quite a cocky little kid and so they're like, okay, kill him. And, and then the, the big brother comes in and goes, you know what, let's not kill him. Instead, let's just throw him in a ditch. Look, there's some pirates coming. Maybe they'll get them, get him. So they toss the guy in a ditch. But what we find in chapter 37, verse 11, is this not hindering of God in this evil is, a pre is present. It starts with their own jealousy of the brothers in chapter 37, verse 11. His brothers were jealous Fast forward a few verses. They wanted to kill him by verse 20. And they back off by verse 24 and instead toss him in a pit. And yet, what's so interesting about the account, and we're going to go there so you can stay in Genesis, but we're, gonna, we're just going to say for now that what's interesting about the account is by the time you get to chapter 45, Joseph is not talking about what they've done. He's talking about what God has done. He's talking about in the language, God sent me before you. You go to the book of Exodus, chapter four, and you have Moses, who at one point, by the way, in his 40s was like, dude, I got this. I am going to save my people Israel. And he goes and he knocks off those two guys, right? And then he flees for 40 years, comes back, and he's a broken man. He's a different man. You know what? He's a usable man by the Lord. And he comes up and the Lord's like, I'm going to use you. He's like, no, 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 I can't, 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 and God says in Exodus 4, 11, who makes man mute? Oh, wait a minute. Mute? Yeah. Or deaf or seeing or blind. Natural causes. Is it not I, the Lord? Making man mute, blind, deaf. Is it not I, the Lord? Deuteronomy 32, 39. I kill and I make alive. Isaiah 45, verse 7. This is an interesting one. He says, I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity, it says. Or some may have the word evil because the word is evil. I am the Lord who does all these things. Listen to Amos chapter 3, verse 6. Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? Go to the book of Job. God gives Satan permission to bring this evil upon Job. And what I find so interesting about Job in chapter 1, verse 21, is one of the most powerful things Job has in terms of dealing with the circumstances that were in his life was his ability to see past secondary causes for his misery to the Lord. We know the phrase, it's famous, the Lord has given and Satan has taken away, but blessed be the name of the Lord, right? Right? Well, that's not in the song, but that's who did it. There's something connected to the Lord gives. We're all like, yep, 
Then we're trying to defend him when, no, it was Satan. Satan takes away. Blessed, that's where my passion for worship comes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. No, 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 no. The passion Job had to worship and acknowledge in submissive obedience to God that blessed be his name is his confident assertion beyond secondary causes that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's fire. That'll put some steel in your backbone. And let us not forget that the worst evil that has ever befallen the world in human history was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. No matter what you see, take in, think about history. Think about all that has happened. We don't even, I don't think as Christians necessarily agree with that because we are so not mindful in the right way about how holy, how majestic, how glorious God is. And so we see all these significant evils in the world and it's hard for us to see that the one that is infinitely worse is the crucifixion of the Son of God. And in Acts chapter two, we see just how sovereign God is in this. When Peter's preaching, he says, this Jesus, in verse 23, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So somehow there's responsibility on them, and all of that was according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. But you know what? That must have been a typo. He says it again. It's so helpful when he just says it again. You're like, I'm, I, I don't know if I buy that. Well, well you're going to have to unbuy it twice. Chapter 4, verse 28. We'll go up a little bit. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. God wills evil to exist. In my mind, point proven. Not only was the act of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ ordained by God and thus no accident, thus no plan B, so were the actions and the actors. This is what's so stunning about the God of the Bible. This is what Piper was talking about in my intro quote. The sovereignty of God sits like landmines waiting for someone to seriously open it up. God doesn't just use evil. But he brings about certain evil for an infinitely wise and morally satisfactory reason. I'm okay at the end of the day with my lost friends not understanding that because guess what? I don't understand that all the way. But if we ever think, we have the audacity to think that we're going to give this argument and it's going to win over some non-Christian, first of all, you don't know that their, their issue isn't primarily intellectual, it's moral. That's the first problem. And second of all, for us to ever say that, oh, we can explain your question all the way down to every little detail makes God a lot smaller than he actually is and you a lot bigger than you actually are. I'd rather leave them with an unfathomably great God, to borrow the words of John Piper. So what is that satisfactory reason? Let's, let's now move to that. I want to get to the heart of where this plays out in our lives. God wills evil to exist for a glorious purpose. God wills evil to exist for a glorious purpose. It's all over scripture. R.C. Sproul, in a message he gave about what is evil and where does it come from, said this. This is so interesting. He, he talks about Isaiah 5.20, that it is a sin to call evil good and good evil. But this is how he broke it down. I thought this was really helpful. He said, quote, evil is not good, but it is good that evil exists. 
we're, we're blowing minds. Evil is not good, but it is good that God exists. You say, well, what is that good? I want to know what that good is. How does God and his greater glory bring hope to man, bring hope to you and I in our circumstances, in our suffering, in our sorrows? How does God bring that purpose to bear? Well, we can get it out of Genesis and the story of Joseph. In chapter 50, verse 20, we see sort of the Old Testament, Romans 8, 28. That he can look his brothers in the face despite their jealousy, despite their anger, despite their heart to want to murder him. If it weren't for the restraint of Reuben, they would have done it. They dug a pit. They stuck him, or they didn't dig the pit. It was there. They tossed him into the pit. Somebody picks him off. And Joseph, after all the hardship, 13 years and pretty horrific conditions, passed up in several different ways, is able to say to them in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. That is the verse in my mind of the Old Testament to describe the complexities of evil. You meant it for evil. God means it for good. I just want you to think for a second. Just, I know this is so hard because we get so consumed in our own stuff, but think about for a moment all the evil that doesn't go on in the world. It's hard even to process that. But just think for a second, even to yesterday, you're like, oh, yesterday was horrible. Okay, think back to Friday then. Like, just even in your own personal life, think back to a time, like, think about all the things that God in his grace is restraining, choosing not to will, to allow, to permit, or to not hinder. He, he's choosing to hinder some things. What that tells us is, for all that is in the world, what Evil that does come up, God purposes for good. It doesn't get through God's hands. God's sovereign over all of it. And he's specifically working for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's a promise for believers. Now listen, when you get into that place where you try to let God off the hook and try to explain, well, there's some evil in the universe that God isn't really responsible for, then you make Romans 8.28 into a hopeful fortune cookie statement instead of the promise it's supposed to be rock solid for our faith for the rest of our lives. Don't make it a fortune cookie statement. Don't be embarrassed by God. Let God be God. And you surrender. You change you come under him. He is glorious. He is good. If you think he's some sort of capricious overlord, you don't have the understanding of the God as he's revealed himself in the Bible. We can submit to this God. He is good and he is faithful. We see his purposes playing out in all kinds of ways. In Exodus, when we were talking about Moses and him being sent and those judgments coming down on Pharaoh in Egypt, what was the point? So that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth, God leveraging evil so his name might be proclaimed. In Amos, who, what, when disaster comes to a city, is it not I the Lord? There's a series of disasters that come in chapter four and after each one of them, the result or the end statement is, yet you did not return to me. He's disrupting your lives so you would see your sin for what it is. You'd see reality for what it is and you return to the Lord who has graciously sustained your life in the midst of also uprooting your comfortabilities, not killing you, but alarming you, and yet you did not return to me. In Isaiah 45, we talked about he's creating calamity and, and good Verse eight, the next verse says, so that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Or how about John nine? You remember the guy that was born blind in John nine? And the Pharisees are like, man, who was this? What, what was the problem here? Was it the parents? Okay, were the rents pieces of, of garbage? Or was it him? And Jesus responds to them and says, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. And so where do we find that ultimate pinnacle, the, the worst evil in, the universe, in, in existence, in history, was, was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And where we see the greatest evil, we also see the greatest glory of God on display. Question comes up, well, could God uh, have been magnified and glorified in an unfallen, not needing redemption world? Sure. 
But think about it. That glory would be without the cross. It would be without the empty tomb of the incarnate son of God. The gospel as the greatest glory is humanity's greatest good and we get to behold it in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so I wanna suggest to you, there are three ways we hold fast, both in our defense and in our understanding for our own souls to how we understand evil and how the gospel plays into that. Three realities I wanna just leave you with that I pray will minister to your soul in the midst of the evil and suffering that you face and that we see in the world. Three realities three ways the gospel is the greatest glory and humanity's greatest good. First one is this, Jesus Christ is the sin bearer. He himself bore our sins on his body, on that tree. When we think about evil, We think about the evil that's done against us. We think about the evil that's done around us. And if you truly want to triumph over evil, if you want to understand evil rightly, then it starts with seeing evil first as a problem in you and a problem that's perpetrated by you. And I'm talking to every single person here. If evil only stays in the outside realm and never gets into, no, you are the problem. You are part of the problem as a sinner. Evil is perpetrated by you and it's a problem in you. This is part of the glorious nature of the gospel. That in God's glorious and infinite wisdom, Romans 3 says, as he's making so clear, we're all condemned in our sin, that it was our unrighteousness that God used to serve to show his own righteousness. How would we understand his righteousness as clearly as we do now because of our own unrighteousness? He says in Romans chapter five, verse eight, that while we were yet sinners and enemies, Christ died for us. How would we know the love of God in its depths without the reality of God sending Jesus to die for enemies? This is our God. This is what he's done. How would we know his righteousness and his holiness? Unless Jesus Christ was sent, God being both the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus, and we would never truly understand the pinnacle of the glory of God found in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We would never understand the significance of the cross without God's allowing of evil. Using our unrighteousness to serve, to show his righteousness off to the world. And so you can do one of two things. You could complain all day long and say, this is a whole load of garbage in Christianity. This is the reason. Forget all this is so stupid. You can complain, or here's the other thing. You can come. You can come to Jesus Christ. You can come to worship him as Savior and Lord. That is so stunning. I can't even believe I can say that in light of what's true of us in the word. He invites you to himself. He invites you to turn from your sin and place your faith in Jesus and trust in him so that when you stand before a holy God of which you will give an account because he is the creator, you are the created thing, you are an image bearer of God, you will die, you will give an account. It's appointed for that day, judgment to come. And yet in that day, by faith in Jesus Christ, you can be assured that the judgment that was supposed to fall on you has fallen on him. That by faith, Christ's righteousness, his perfect obedience to the law is credited to your account. You can complain or you can come, but the only way to benefit from God's glory in redemption is to turn to the Redeemer, to Jesus Christ for your salvation. That's the most offensive one, but it's also the most important one. Because in our evil, we want to talk about our suffering and our hurt and woe is me and these things have happened and I get it and we're all humans and we feel that way and so there is hope for that but it's not the first thing. Christ the sin bearer is the first thing. Here's the second thing, Christ the man of sorrows. Christ the man of sorrows. Isaiah 53, 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. 
not just our sin, but our sorrows. This is the glory of God. Christ displaying the greatness of the glory of God entered into our sorrow suffering in himself to overcome our suffering. This is our God. He entered in, partook of our suffering, that by his work we might overcome suffering. His work, Jesus' work for eternity will never be overlooked. It will never be forgotten. And everything we will enjoy as Christians by sheer faith as a free gift of God's grace, we will enjoy because of the fact that Jesus Christ accomplished for us in his suffering what we needed him to accomplish. By his wounds, we are healed. And Christ, the hope of glory, number three. Christ, the hope of glory. We have a sympathetic high priest. Gracious of God to give us Jesus as our substitute, rose conquering sin and death, ascended to the right hand of God, sits at the right hand of God where he lives to make intercession for us. But one of the things that's interesting about evil and affliction today is according to 2 Corinthians 4, the greater our afflictions are, the sweeter our glorification will be. And so while some of us are going to experience more evil than someone else, those greater afflictions will make sweeter the glorification that is to come, even the glory in salvation through judgment, according to Revelation 18, which we struggle to sing about now, but the saints are proclaiming, holy is God's name in song. Christ being our hope of glory, here's what we know. We know that evil is not ultimate. We know evil's future. God will rid this universe of evil, of sin and its effects, and we will inhabit a new heaven and a new earth where there is no more death, there's no more pain, there's no more sin, there's no more sorrow. Here's what we have to remember, and again, I'm trying to tie this into the gospel. In order to understand evil, we must see evil within the context of God's redemptive drama. It's not over yet. We live in the midst of it. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day for you to acknowledge your own evil, for you to see Jesus Christ as the sin bearer and the suffering servant and the man of sorrows who took your place and by his stripes you can be healed. Because what has happened is he's created the world. That's the first part of the redemptive drama. We fell in sin. He sent a redeemer and soon by the work of the redeemer that's already accomplished, that we're already experiencing some of the joys of today, that fullness will be consummated in the time to come. The story's not over. God does win. God does take over. He does rule in perfect righteousness and in perfect holiness. Today is a day of grace. And I pray it's a day of salvation to those who would rather talk about their problems with God and evil than submit to the very one who sent his son to overcome our sin and our suffering in his own being our sin bearer and suffering for us. Let's pray. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Father, evil is one of those things that we just testify. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We look out at the brokenness, even the simple brokenness of our world, and every one of those things should remind us of the sweetness of the time that is to come. There is a hope of glory for anyone from any background, no matter how much sin is in their life, no matter how much stuff has happened to them, there is hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, there is hope in Jesus. Would you grant us confidence to understand we are not done with the story. It is not over. Evil has been triumphed over in Jesus Christ he took out death by dying himself. He rose again, showing that death is powerless over those who trust in Jesus. 
He led the way. We are to follow and those who will put their faith in him. God, would you grant forgiveness of sins and salvation by faith to those who don't know you, both online and in person today. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.